and by the time you turn on the morning news, within the first gulp of, of coffee, you're also swallowing a scalding dose of violence. And there is another more emerging story, another unfolding story that I've captured in my book, and I'd love to, to share some of the stories today. I think in many ways, beyond the hysteria, um, there is a flowing river of people, of organizations, of actions, of movements, the likes of which we've never seen before. There's a flowing river of peace, of people aligning, finding one another, mobilizing, coming together, reaching out to one another, speaking and acting for peace. And this is causing epic change across the planet. And this is the story that I think in many ways is not often covered by the national media, and that's a story I'd like to share today. This river of peace is so powerful that the New York Times is calling it the world's other superpower the world's other superpower. And again, this is a story we can invest in. Dr. Robert Mueller, who used to be the uh, Assistant Secretary General of the UN, who's now at the uh, University of Peace in Costa Rica, has said, never before in the history of the world has there been a global, visible, public, open dialogue and conversation about the legitimacy of war. And in so many ways, we're writing an entirely new chapter in our humanity, I, I feel. Journalists and others who've been embedded with uh, military forces have said there's often extreme resistance to picking up a gun and hurting someone else. It, it runs against our innate nature to harm another person. <laughs> Studies have shown that during World War II, three out of four men could not bring themselves to fire a gun when they could see the other person. And so what I'd love to see is an amplification us hungry more for peace and hungry more for caring and loving for one another. Holman McCarthy has said, peace is as much about getting the bombs out of our own hearts as out of the Pentagon budget. And that's the theme of my book, and that's, that's the story that's running through so many other people that I've interviewed, that we can't be peaceful unless we disarm our own hearts and take out our own prejudices, our own hatreds, our own suspicions. Natalie, one day, dialed a friend, but instead, she got a Palestinian named Jihad. So Natalie had to make the choice at that moment, do I launch a preemptive strike and start screaming at this individual, or hanging up on him, or both, or do I reach out? And Natalie decided to stay on the line and listen to Jihad, who was on his mobile phone, he then called her back, and the two of them started talking and started sharing their own stories of their families and what their hopes were and what their dreams were. Natalie was so moved by what happened because after that, every time there was a terrorist attack or a suicide bomber incident, Jihad and his family will call Natalie to make sure she's okay, to check in with her. She's been so inspired and so touched by that that she decided to set up a hotline for anyone who wanted to connect, any Palestinians and Israelis who really wanted to get to know the real story of one another. So she set up a hotline called the Hello Shalom, Hello Salam hotline. And it was set up through a forum of people who had already lost loved ones in the war, but who still believed intensely that there could be a better way. So they were saying at that time that 40,000 people had used that hotline to reach out and connect to one another. There's even voiced, um, people tape voicemail messages telling their story and asking if they could connect with someone on the other camp. And so people who don't feel they have the courage to connect in person can connect on a voicemail message to find out that they're not evil, that they're simply human beings who want to connect. And that is, I think, the reality that we're now realizing, that peace is not some abstract, out there, um, unreachable thing that someone wiser will deliver to us. We're at a juncture in our humanity and our history that we have to anchor in peace ourselves right where we're at. And one person as a powerful force of peace can make immense things happen. There's a school in India, the City Montessori sorry, School in, I believe it's pronounced Lucknow, India. They believe peace works, and they put it into action. And in 1992, um, there was violence that broke out throughout India. Um, a mosque was destroyed about 40 miles from, from Lucknow, and violence then spread between the Hindus and the Muslims all throughout India. And I, I think about 3,000 people, at least 3,000 people were killed 
And so they knew, logically, that that all could come to visit them at the, in the capital in Lucknow. So the students decided, this isn't acceptable. We've got to deploy peace. We can make a difference. So the kids got, got trucks, I guess, jeeps with loudspeakers if they had to, and they drove throughout the city with these loudspeakers, appealing to people not to fight, appealing to people to stay calm, to stay reasonable, to hold the peace. And behind every Jeep walked their parents and their teachers. So thousands of people were in this parade asking people to hold the peace. And they believed, they, they knew they could be a zone, a zone to hold the peace. And no violence, no riots, not one person was killed in their city. He said, but anyone with a heart and compassion who hears what happens to others around the world should take up a cause. Our blessings in this country are not just for ourselves, but to give back to the world, to give our gifts back to the world. He said, if we all did one simple thing in our lives, one simple thing right where we are, we'd have a million miles of change, is how he describes it, a million miles of change. And I think that is the underwriting message of my book and the underwriting message of all these peacemakers that we don't have to go to Liberia and appeal to the child soldiers. We don't have to go to the Middle East and try and create peace among the Palestinians and the Israelis unless that calls to you. If that absolutely calls to you, you absolutely have to do that. But we have to make peace right where we're at, starting with ourselves, knowing that we are the peace. Yes. How many of you heard Desmond Tutu when he was here? I know some of us were in, you know, saw each other there. Desmond Tutu said in, at the very end of his talk, this diminutive little man, that's what, was so, what really struck me, and I think some of us who talked about it, such a beautiful force for peace and such a diminutive little spirit, but what a powerful, powerful man. And he said, you know, he fling his arms up to the sky and he said, dream peace. Americans, dream peace. And you could just feel it vibrate all throughout the room, the idea that we can dream peace. He said, if South Africa can have, have peace, you can have peace. So dream peace.